Uh, my name is Dan Culver. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, it's nice to be here in Manhattan. Thanks for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit differently maybe than some of the other speakers, and I'll, I may try to go through this a little quickly so we can get to some of the questions. I, I said that this, we could just have a four-hour session of answering questions here, and we wouldn't need to do any presentations, and I think that might be just fine. In any event, I wanted to, to just introduce you uh, to some of the new research findings in sarcoidosis. Uh, that was the charge here. And, and what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to tell you about some of the tools and the ways we're approaching the disease uh, or diseases rather than exact research findings. And what I'll focus on is I'll focus on some of the scientific end of things. I'm not going to talk about new research findings in treatment or in making the diagnosis, but the things that people ask when they come in the door, like what caused this? Why did I get it and my brother didn't? Things like that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the tools. I like pictures, so I'll show you a lot of pictures with data. Uh, I don't expect that there will be a quiz afterwards on any of these pictures. Uh, but it's just to give you a, a sense of the scope of what's happening. And I think that as you guys, uh, uh, as an active, energized community of people who are interested in a disease and many of who have the disease, uh, to the extent that you can continue to participate in research, you, those of you who have donated blood to the biobank here or to other activities, to the extent that you can advocate for research in sarcoidosis, I think this is an exciting time, uh, and it's because there are patients who are willing to do this, there are scientists who are looking at it, and we have new tools, and I'll show you a little bit of it. So here's a granuloma. Uh, Dr. Uh, Morgenthau already showed you a picture of a granuloma. Um, interesting thing about this granuloma uh, is that this is not sarcoidosis. This is another disease called chronic beryllium disease. Uh, this is a disease that used to be called Salem sarcoidosis uh, because it was thought to be sarcoidosis until people discovered that this metal, beryllium, uh, actually causes a disease that looks exactly like sarcoidosis. And this is one of the challenges of doing research in sarcoidosis because if you took patients with chronic beryllium disease and you lumped them in with patients with sarcoidosis and you did research on them to try to find out what the genes are or what the cause is, you might get confused. You'd be looking at two different animals, apples and oranges maybe, instead of just oranges. So this is one of the challenges of doing research in sarcoidosis is defining what it is. Second challenge is, has already been alluded to by the speakers, and that is, are we only dealing with one disease? And so you can see, if you look at different organs, you have a patient with inflammation in the back of their eye, a patient with a lot of lymph glands here in their neck. This is a CAT scan. Here's a patient with inflammation of the lining of the brain. Here's a patient with skin sarcoidosis and a patient with involvement of the heart. And in fact, these all, we, we call these all sarcoidosis, and they may all well be one disease, uh, but they probably have different genetics and maybe they even have different things that cause them. We don't know that for sure. Again, it's a question of are you a lumper or a splitter? These are challenges as we think about research in sarcoidosis. So why don't we know more about this, right? This has been discovered more than 100 years ago. People have already said that. And I think there are some reasons. Number one, it's not the most common disease, especially as it's recognized it's not the most common disease. Second thing is we don't really have a great model to take into the lab and study this in an animal. We have a sort of a model and we kind of use it and we go to meetings and talk about it. It's not a great model of sarcoidosis, okay? And that is a limit, I think, both for understanding the disease and for getting pharmaceutical industry interested in studying the disease. They would like to take their drug, put it into an animal and see that it works there first before they take it into a human trial. Third thing is what I alluded to, that the disease is a little fuzzy. Our, is everything we're looking at sarcoidosis? Is the World Trade Center granulomatous-like disease sarcoidosis or not? And you can go down the line and find a lot of places where you can be a lumper or a splitter. If you want a lot of patients to study, then you're more of a lumper. If you want to be really clean with your phenotypes and you want to really, really, really narrow down on something, then you're a splitter. That makes it harder to do the research. And finally, I think a key thing and something that's been a real sticking point, and I'll show you a little bit of data about that, is What's found in the Netherlands may not apply to what's found in New York, may not apply to what's found in Japan. The genetics are different, maybe the environmental exposures are different, and so we can't necessarily translate things uh, without thinking about it from one site to another. Okay, so those are all barriers. But I'm here to tell you that we are working through all these barriers and everything will be great. Okay, uh, so this is a picture of Louis Siltbach, and you guys have already heard about him. 
uh, uh, he's the person who really uh, developed the Kvime test uh, as a clinical test, which would allow a diagnosis of sarcoidosis to, maybe to be made with a very high degree of specificity. And that was right here at Mount Sinai. Okay? The interesting thing about this Kvime test is that you can take Kvime reagent from a patient in the Netherlands and inject it into a patient in New York, and you will get the same granuloma. Four weeks later, you will biopsy the skin and find the same granuloma. The Kvime reagent is very interesting. You can do a lot of things to the Kvime reagent uh, that you can't do usually in laboratory medicine. You can leave it on the bench. You can heat it up. You can put acid on it. You can put detergents on it, and it still can do the same thing. It's very hardy stuff. And actually, some of the scientific findings that I'm going to show you now are based on people thinking about what is this Kvime reagent like? And or is there any other thing that happens in human biology that acts just like that? And I'll show you some interesting findings that have to do with that and that were based on people going back to this notion of the Kvime reagent and thinking about it, okay? Uh, but before we get to that, let me show you how we got to where we are now. And this is really the mainstay of how we have studied sarcoidosis in the last 30 years. This is bronchoscopy. This is what lung doctors love to do. How many people in here have had a bronchoscopy? How many people in here thought that that was a lovely experience? <laughs> <laughs> Not so many. We learned a lot from bronchoscopy. We really did. You can go down in the lungs. You can wash out some air sacs. You can get some cells from the immune system. It looks a lot like what you find in the granulomas. You can pick your favorite protein. You can study it. You can write a paper and get your name out there. It's great. Bronchoscopy is great for a lot of careers. And we learned a lot about sarcoidosis. But it has some limitations. However, by using bronchoscopy and the prior studies on the Kvime reagent, we were able to kind of come up with a model of what sarcoidosis is. And this is my conception of sarcoidosis. You have two things happen. Maybe it's more than two things. You have something that makes you susceptible. Maybe it's some genes, and maybe it's also some experience your immune system has had before. And then you run into something, okay? Maybe it's something all around the world that's the same. Maybe it's different things in different parts of the world. And you develop a granuloma reaction to it, okay? You may go down one of these pathways. We really don't understand too much why people go down these different pathways, but I think that that's key. My feeling is that whatever's out there in the world causing sarcoidosis is still going to be out there in the world causing sarcoidosis forever. So really, to me, how you can change people going down these pathways is a very important area for research. So this is where we kind of got to with looking at bronchoscopy, uh, and we came up to this model of sarcoidosis. And this is complicated, and, and I'm not going to go through all of this. What I'm going to say is that you get exposed to something, and your body sees that. That's this red thing. It's called an antigen, okay? And the immune system comes together, and they talk about the antigen. It's like a little, uh, like a little uh, book club. They get together, and these two cells, this one, is, this one is eating up the antigen. It's gobbling it up here in the air sac of the lung, and it's putting it on some proteins here. And it's say saying to this other cell, this T cell, hey, look what I found. What do you think about that? And the T cell gets to decide, well, that's important or it's not important. And if the T cell decides it's important and that it looks like a, an infection or something, then it will start to release a lot of chemicals. And some of these chemicals are listed here. And then everybody gets all agitated and it turns into a much larger book club. In fact, it turns into a book riot, okay? <laughs> and that's what inflammation is, as Dr. Morgantown noted. And you can see that some of these chemicals are things that we can use medicines. And by studying bronchoscopy, we've been able to identify some of these chemicals. And those have led to the use of medicines that many of you have been on. So tumor necrosis factor, which is crucial to go from this to a granuloma, is the target of infliximab. It's the target of adalimumab. It's the target of all those biologic agents of which many of you have been on. There's a trial going on now. Many, some of you may have been in it. I'm not sure. Looking at blocking. A, a component of this, this interleukin-12. And you can go on and on down the line, picking out your favorite molecule and trying to figure out if it's important and if you block it, does it make a difference? That's one way to do research in sarcoidosis. Uh, but I think that there's limitation to that. And I'll tell you what the limitation is, and I think it's about this, okay? This is this old Indian parable, right? It's the elephant with the blind guy feeling ele elephant. And then they have to come and they have to describe what does the elephant look like? I think this is probably a derivation of that since this looks more like, uh, you know, like a w you know, white doctors or something. But in any event, uh, they're all feeling different parts of the elephant, and they all think something's important. This guy thinks the elephant feels like a spear. This one thinks it feels like a rope, right? This one thinks it feels like a wall. 
So if you take a strategy of saying, my favorite molecule is TNF, I think that's really important in sarcoidosis, I'm going to do a bronchoscopy, and I'm going to measure TNF, and I'm going to find that it's higher in the sarcoidosis patients than the non-sarcoidosis patients. Hey, yeah, you'll find that, but is that really describing the elephant? Maybe not so much. So what I want to talk to you a little bit is how we're using tools to look at all the parts of the elephant together. And I'll just do a little show and tell about that uh, with some stuff that confuses me. So again, uh, don't try to capture all the details of these things because they're kind of scientific. Here's the first story, okay? This was really developed at Johns Hopkins. This is using the properties of the Klein reagent. Remember how we said that you can really jump up and down on the Klein reagent and nothing will happen to it? So the hypothesis was, what else in the body looks like that? And Dr. Morgenthau mentioned amyloidosis, amyloid protein, uh, of which amyloid-like protein is found in Alzheimer's disease, acts very similar to what you find in the Klein reagent. You can do the same things to it. And so these guys asked, what if we look for amyloid protein in sarcoid granulomas? And here are pictures of three granulomas, two from the lungs and one from a lymph node, with brown staining here showing that there's amyloid protein in sarcoid granulomas. And amyloid protein is interesting because it can rev up the immune system. And in fact, when these guys took this amyloid protein and put it into a rat model of granulomas, not a sarcoidosis, great sarcoidosis model, but a rat model of granulomas, and they looked at the size of the granulomas, just look here at this gray bar, if you give amyloid protein, those granulomas are much larger than the ones that didn't get amyloid protein, suggesting that this revs up the immune system. And I think this is one of the interesting stories that's happened in sarcoidosis recently. And in fact, as a matter, as a matter in fact, this was research that was largely supported by the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research in, in the beginning of this research. And again, that points to the importance of organizations like FSR in really getting us forward. Now, the interesting thing to me most interesting thing about this story with amyloid is this. Here's a whole bunch of other granulomatous diseases, okay? Wegener's granulomatosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis that's come up before, uh, TB, and here's beryllium disease that we just thought was another form of sarcoidosis. These have almost no amyloid staining in them. So this suggests to me that maybe there's something fundamentally different about sarcoidosis and the relationship to amyloid protein as opposed to uh, what you see in any of these other granulomatous lung diseases, okay? And so this kind of leads to a model that looks like this. Maybe you get some kind of stimulus. Uh, this is a cartoon just showing this model. Could be a mycobacterium, but it doesn't have to be. Mycobacterium is a kind of bacteria of which one is TB, but there are many, many different kinds of mycobacteria. And when you get that, you both make amyloid protein and you make, this, the, you make the cells of the immune system talk to each other. And you make all of these proteins and eventually you get into a granuloma up here. Now if this amyloid protein kind of dissolves and goes away, maybe the body can then just clear off the, the antigens and, the, and the whatever the agent is that triggers it, and the disease goes away. If this amyloid protein stays here and it stays gummed up, think about uh, uh, your, your garbage disposal when it gets gummed up by putting too many carrot shavings in there, that's the one that happened to me last week. Uh, then you just are stuck, okay? And the disease persists. That's a theory, it's a hypothesis. I think it's interesting. And I mean, if you think about new things that are interesting in sarcoidosis, I think this is one of the things that's pretty interesting. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about genetics. And I had a, I had a little prop here. We're going to talk about genetics using the phone book. <laughs> oh, is it there? Yeah. All right. Oh, there's my prop. Uh, I do uh, use the phone book in having a hotel room. I was expecting a bigger phone book for Manhattan, but I guess people don't really use the phone book anymore, <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyway, there's the prop. Here's what genetics is like. Genetics has some has really led to some advances. It's not going to be the answer to everything, but I think it's getting us some interesting answers. Okay, genetics is like reading the phone book. The instructions for everything that goes on in your body are written on your genetic code with three billion base pairs, okay? So think about a phone book with three billion letters in it, okay? And then think about taking all the phone books in Manhattan and looking at the order of letters in every single phone book in Manhattan and then looking at the order of letters in every single phone book in Brooklyn and taking all of those phone books and putting them in two giant rooms and comparing them. 
And that's what we can do with genetics now. It's pretty powerful. It requires a lot of computing power. So here's how, here's, here's how genetics works. You have your DNA, which is on 23 chromosomes. It's packed tightly inside your cell. That's like a recipe. That gets translated and written down on little index cards. So when you want to make a recipe, you write that. You go to the phone book. You open up, find the recipe you want, and write it on an index card. And that's made into something called RNA that's not in this picture. And then you cook it, and that makes proteins. Okay? And proteins are what you eat. They're what does work in your body. They're what your body's made out of. Okay? So we can look at all these things in sarcoidosis, DNA, RNA, proteins, in order to get some answers about why disease is happening in one person or another or worse in one person or another or what's causing it. All right, so genetics have traditionally focused on things that we already knew were important based on bronchoscopy studies. So again, you have a cell here that's eating up something and it's talking to the T cell about that thing. And so this HLA molecule, which is a receptor, it's a little docking receptor that's actually showing the other cell what's going on, has been the focus of a lot of genetic studies, okay? And if you look at HLA genes in various patients, you can find that certain, that people with sarcoidosis have different kinds of HLA genes more often than people without sarcoidosis. So that's one thing you can use to kind of say, hey, we know a gene that kind of seems to be causing or contributing to sarcoidosis. But again, that's a very elephant sort of approach, right? Now I'm going to show you two studies that have looked at putting all the phone books in two rooms and comparing them. And the first is a German study. And this is a family study where they took families with sarcoidosis. And all I want to show you here is that they were looking at this on a chromosome by chromosome level. Remember, there's 23 chromosomes. Here's one, two, three. And they look at, for each physical position of the chromosome, as you move through that phone book, where do all the phone books line up so all the sarcoidosis patients look the most the same and all the non-sarcoidosis patients look the most different from those sarcoidosis patients? And you can do statistical tests and find out where the phone book, that letter, that 58,314th letter looks exactly the same in the sarcoidosis patients more often than most. And they found this spot here on chromosome 6, and it's about 1,000 times more likely. And so they said, well, let's really map the genome right there. We'll look at all of the letters in the phone book instead of just some random letters. And they do this here, right here at this peak in chromosome 6. They do this fine mapping study, and they find all of these markers, and they find this area, uh, which is in a gene called BTNL2. And that allows them to say, hey, look, all the sarcoidosis patients seem to line up here together. So what do we know about this protein? This is a protein, in fact, that sits on the surface of the cell and allows the cells to talk to each other. So this has biologic plausibility. And in fact, if you go and you look at the protein in the cells of patients who have this particular genetic difference, this polymorphism, you can see that normally the protein is all throughout the cells. That's what's shown here in green. Uh, but if you have this mutant genotype, this one that they found in the sarcoidosis patients, uh, I'm sorry, it's scattered in the cells, and in the wild type, it's more uh, on the periphery of the cells where it needs to be to communicate to other cells. And so, in fact, in Germany, where they did this study, they, they decided that about 23% of sarcoidosis was due to this gene. This was a major advance, all right? We didn't know what caused sarcoidosis. Now we have a genetic explanation for a high proportion of why patients get sarcoidosis. Now, what's sobering about that story? If you come over here to the U.S., and you look in the African-American population, guess how much this gene has to do with sarcoidosis? Zero. Nothing. Okay? And that's what I was talking about, about you have to look at different populations. All right? Now, let's say you took those phone books, and you took them out and put them in two different rooms, and you did the same thing again. Would you still find this gene? How many people think you'll find this gene if you did the same experiment again using maybe a different technology? You won't. Okay? And this is a challenge, but you might find something new that's interesting. So here's another study that was just published, and I'll just show you this because they did the same sort of thing. They found one marker uh, that really associates strongly with sarcoidosis, and they, they, they then marked all of these areas. Here's a map with the genome. You can think about this as street addresses, and they, they looked at all of these addresses and found certain ones. The higher they are, the more likely they are to associate with sarcoidosis. And as they came down here, uh, they, they found some genes that make proteins. These are some recipes which were associated with sarcoidosis, 
And they were able to use these then to go back to bronchoscopy and ask, do we see these in lung? Are these important in sarcoidosis? So this is a way of, instead of looking at one thing, it's looking at the whole elephant and then toning down your results so you get down to something that you didn't decide on beforehand. It's something that was not a priori suspected. And so when they did this for this particular gene, this RAB23 gene, which is a gene that's involved in taking things that your cell eats up and then getting them out there to the cell surface to present to other cells, they found that there is indeed RAB23 in the lung as well as in some other organs like the pancreas, the small intestine. And if you look at sarcoidosis patients, for four of these genes that they thought were interesting, it's only the RAB23, which is low in controls and high in sarcoidosis patients. And so this, I think, is an example of how we can use these bioinformatics and these larger scale technology platforms to get to candidate mediators uh, that we didn't just decide on because that was our bias. All right, so let's go to the <coughs> next step here. So we looked at the phone books. Now let's look at the index cards. Let's look at the recipes, okay? Because that could be another thing that really informs what's happening with sarcoidosis. We can do this again by using one of the newer technologies. And we can look at all of the recipes, all the index cards that are floating around in the human body at any time. That's called RNA. And we can look at the RNA of 23,000 different genes using one of these chips that's about this big. And every gene is represented nine times with the actual gene and nine times with something that looks like the gene, but it's not quite that, so it's a control. And we can then take samples from people, put them on these chips, and see which areas of those chips <coughs> light up, which recipe cards are more prevalent in sarcoidosis patients than in control patients. Okay, so here's what one of these chips really looks like from an experiment we did. So there's 23,000 genes times 18 probes represented on this chip. And if you blow it up, you end up with something like this, and you scan this in some kind of a computer, and it allows you to say, at this particular location, there's a real hot signal. Uh, this looks like something from CSI, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is a little like we're following behind CSI in sarcoidosis. Anyway, uh, then you might say, well, I know what's at this address. Let's go looking for that. Okay, so this is what we did. This is some work that uh, Elliot Krauser did and we did with him, uh, looking at lung tissue and lymph node tissue from sarcoidosis patients and from controls. And we used these chips and we just took lymph nodes and lungs and we ground them up, got the RNA out, and we put them on these chips and we asked, what are the differences in where these chips light up, okay? And then instead of using just one address, we said, what neighborhoods go together? Because really, finding a neighborhood that has it, it would be more powerful than finding one single address because then you can really start to tell about what area is being affected by it. And so that's what we did. And here's what we found. We found that this transcription factor, this, this thing that dictates which recipe cards get written down, was the central dominant neighborhood involved in sarcoidosis. And here it is right here, it's called STAT1. And you can find that there are a lot of other genes, uh, some of which, for example, I think Dr. Judson, you might, your skin thing might have been the first to describe this, IL-7, uh, some of which we never suspected before, but which give us candidates to look at as targets in sarcoidosis. So we decided STAT1 was important. If you stain a lymph node for STAT1, you can see that there's a lot of STAT1 staining brown here in the lymph node. And in fact, that kind of fit with what we already knew. Okay, okay, we'll just skip that. Now a follow-up study to that is, can you take that into the blood? Because if you could take that into the blood, you can start to imagine looking at gene products as markers of sarcoidosis, right? Rather than using the ACE level, which is just one single thing, could you use a combination of these things and use this kind of neighborhood approach to find a, a signal or a fingerprint of sarcoidosis that allows you to distinguish it from other sorts of diseases? So here's a group in San Francisco that did this, comparing our biopsy data set uh, to what they found in the blood. And they found that the blood was a pretty good representation uh, for what was on in the biopsy, suggesting that you might be able to use the blood to tell what's going on in the tissue. And this is a lot of gobbledygook, but it's basically showing you that uh, mostly that what genes are important, each one of these is a gene or a recipe card, 
are in sarcoidosis are also important in tuberculosis. And it reminds us that granulomas are a stereotypical response of the immune system. And so that any granulomatous disease might give you similar findings in some of these studies. They also showed in this that there may be some markers that would allow you to distinguish between granulomatous diseases. So I think this is another thing you're going to see going forward, that we will be able to use blood tests in combination to try to mark out or define sarcoidosis or different kinds of sarcoidosis. Now let's talk about what causes it. This is the last thing I want to talk about. Um, and this is why I put this TB stuff in here. Um, I think there have been some advances in this. This is not a done deal or a finished story, but I'll show you a little bit of data about this. It's been pretty well established for a long time that there's some kind of environmental exposure that causes sarcoidosis. This is one of the old studies looking at inducted military personnel during World War II and looking at where all the sarcoidosis patients were from the US. All of them got x-rays, and they found, in fact, uh, both in Caucasians and in African Americans, similar things, and that is that it was heavily concentrated in the Southeast. And I think this is one of the things that led to that whole pine pollen business. Uh, but in any event, uh, there have been a number of studies suggesting that uh, area, certain areas tend to get sarcoidosis more. Uh, in fact, many of these areas are areas that also tend to have more marshy, swampy, uh, uh, more moist environments. And the epidemiologic study, the access study, where they looked at occupations, found that many of the occupations associated with sarcoidosis had similar features, exposure to bioaerosols. And that fits in with what people have thought for a while about maybe some kind of a microbacterium, not TB per se, but maybe a cousin of TB, could be triggering sarcoidosis in some patients. And maybe it's just the little protein that's left from that microbacterium that's making it persist. I don't think that we can say it's an active infection, but maybe your body doesn't get rid of it, maybe that because of the amyloid protein. Here's a whole bunch of studies that have been done looking at DNA from mycobacteria and sarcoidosis patients. And you can see if you start here where they didn't find any DNA from mycobacteria to here where they found it in 100% of their patients, uh, that they find overall about 20 or 30% of people have DNA from mycobacteria in the granulomas. That doesn't prove it caused the problem, but it is kind of suspicious, right? That's kind of like finding the wrench in the library, right? You kind of know where something happens. Anyway, uh, the next step in this that I think was important went back to the Clymer reagent. And what the investigators did is they used the properties of the Clymer reagent to look for proteins from mycobacteria. And I'll just show you that in a very complicated slide. Here's a sarcoidosis patient here. Here's a patient without sarcoidosis. If you take protein from a sarcoidosis patient and you put it with a patient who doesn't have sarcoidosis or one that does have sarcoidosis, and you do everything to it that you can do to the climb reagent, thank you, you will find that there are extra pieces of protein that were not present in the control patient. The control person doesn't recognize them and doesn't have them in their tissue. If you cut that protein out of that experiment and you put it into a mass spectroscopy machine, something that lets you tell what the protein is, when they did this, they found protein from mycobacteria. Now you're starting to find DNA and protein from mycobacteria. That's two out of the three parts of the, cook of the, of the recipe, right, of making the recipe. Now that's getting pretty interesting. So Wonder Drake then, uh, who at, at Vanderbilt, and, and we did this with her, and Dr. Judson, in fact, was involved with this as well, uh, asked, do these proteins cause immune responses that look like sarcoidosis? Because if you can find that sarcoidosis patients have the DNA and have the protein and have an immune response, then it's starting to get more interesting. And so we looked at patients who were having bronchoscopy. We took their bronchoalveolar lavage cells, and we stimulated them with proteins uh, from different kinds of mycobacteria or different mycobacterial proteins. And I'll just show you a little bit of those data just to give you a flavor of what that looks like. Here's a type of T cell, and this is going to show you if the T cell is responding. Here's a protein we know that's important in sarcoidosis. That's interferon gamma. Just concentrate on this panel here. Only 0.7% of the cells are normally have, uh, that are T cells are making interferon gamma. If you put in these two mycobacterial proteins, ESAT6 or catalase G, you get up to about 2% of cells. That doesn't seem like a lot, but actually that's, that's enough to be an important response for your immune system. 
So sarcoidosis patients, but not control patients, patients with other lung diseases, have seen mycobacterial proteins before, and they're very interested in mycobacterial proteins. Remember what I told you about when that antigen-presenting cell eats up uh, something that it sees, and then it presents it during the coffee club, and it says, are you interested in this? The T cells in sarcoidosis patients are very interested in this protein. And in fact, if you look at sarcoidosis patients, that's these uh, boxes here, they react much more strongly, about two-thirds of them react to these proteins as compared to controls, which almost don't react at all. And they're not just reacting to this Cat-G protein, they're actually reacting also to this ESAT-6 protein. So this suggests to me, this really changed my, my thinking about this. I used to think this was just one little protein that was stuck in the primary agent. This suggests that there's more than one protein in the sarcoidosis granuloma that's important. And then you start thinking about, well, if it's more than one protein, what is it really? Is it a piece of an organism? Is it a non-viable organism? Is it a whole bunch of proteins that are just stuck in there? I think the possibilities are much wider uh, than when I first got involved with this disease. And so, in fact, if you look at how many patients respond to more than one protein, <coughs> and that's here in the red, the majority of sarcoidosis patients responded to more than one protein, uh, whereas people who uh, had a negative skin test for TB mostly didn't. And people with a different kind of mycobacterial infection called non-tuberculous mycobacteria uh, uh, responded in about the same proportion as the sarcoidosis patients. So I don't think this proves that mycobacteria causes the disease, but as people come in and ask me, hey, what caused me to get this? I think this gives us a clue that there probably is some involvement of some kind of organic antigen, some protein that your immune system is still reacting to and this certainly is a leading contender right now based on where we are. And in fact, we've gone on to kind of develop an animal model uh, of what looks a little more like sarcoidosis using one of these proteins, superoxide dismutase A, and I'll just skip over this, except to say these are the kind of granulomas we can develop with this animal model. So in any event, uh, the main thing that I want to acknowledge here is uh, that the research that I've done, the research on the amyloid protein, uh, and much of the research in Germany is supported by foundational support. And so to the extent that we as a sarcoid community of physicians, patients, family members, interested parties can keep the, the, the heat going in sarcoidosis, keep the interest going, and keep feeding and being participatory in the disease, we'll continue to make advances. And I think the technology is there. I think the interest is there. It's just something that we have to leverage, and, and we are leveraging. So thank you very much.